Okay. Now, it's interesting to know that you have been in the military service. Uh, enemy seems to uh, have been made by someone who doesn't especially like the army. Uh, but the, the, I didn't do a military service, I did mm. a national service, uh -huh. and as a filmmaker, so I never carried a weapon in my life. Uh, I never shot a rifle. Have you uh, been wearing a uniform? No, okay. no, uh, because we have this special system in France where I was sent to the Cameroons to teach cinema because I was a graduate of the film school. Okay. So I did my national duty during the time other people do their military service, but I was detached to the foreign affairs. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's why I'm, I'm very much a pacifist. <laughs> <laughs> so where are your sympathies for uh, armies? I have very little sympathy for the army, as you probably have seen in this movie, which, um, you know, you can have a confusion by uh, learning that it's a movie that takes place in Stalingrad. Um, but this is why I, I like the German title, Duel, because it's very much a story centered around a duel. You know, Stalingrad itself was a battle which was a duel between two dictators. And what fascinated me in that uh, story was that at the local level, the propaganda made a gr great deal and paid a lot of attention to the destiny of two men as well, which were carrying the flag of their nation and were uh, confronted uh, in, in, in a duel where the outcome had an influence on the outcome of the big battle. This is why I was so fascinated by this anecdote. And I have a sort of Western and psychological movie together inside the frame of the war, but I don't see this movie as a war movie at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't possibly possibly label it as an anti-war movie. You, you know, it depends. Uh, I I don't do movies to send messages. You know, but of course they convey um, a certain number of emotions and I hope reflections where people may uh, find that yes what they've seen uh, is not very encouraging in uh, to push them towards war and that would be very good if, it, if that happens you know when I, when I researched uh, around that uh, real anecdote I realized how those million those two million people that were fighting each other hated the fact that they were in this duel, in this uh, battle, hated the fact that uh, they had to kill other honest people in order not to be killed. I mean, you know, it's, uh, when you look at it, very often you've got like two villains, you know, Hitler and Stalin here in that case. But the people that they send to fight, who are they? Honest fathers, honest boyfriends, mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to fight. But do the, re the, the main characters, the snipers, I mean, do they really question their uh, duty? It seems to me they're very eager to do their duty to the fatherland. Yes, they are, because at that point uh, in, in the real history, uh, there was such a hatred of the German invader uh, that misbehaved so, with so much cruelty. You know, you have to remember that uh, the German invasion in Russia was different from the German invasion, say, in France. In France, mm -hmm. they behaved quite nicely. I mean, I'm saying quite. I'm not saying very nicely. I'm saying okay. But in Russia, the propaganda was that they were subhuman. They were not real human beings. You know, they were like animals, uh, like devilish animals. So, uh, the, the the Germans really treated the Russian population with so much disdain, so much hatred, raping women, uh, killing children. I mean, it's just absolutely atrocious. Yeah. This is why uh, the second phase of the battle was so atrocious, because the Russians were ready to die to fight off those invaders. Therefore, it, was, it became a patriotic duty. In those even terms sound, sound so old-fashioned, you know. But that was a period of the human experience, should I say. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not so far away. It's only 60 years ago. But people were in that state of mind. And this is why it was so exciting for me to show that state of mind. True. It's just the way uh, we look at war movies nowadays and in the history of war movies that um, 
could we even call it like an adventure story? Because it's it's Shh. not really anti-war. Well, you know, here, very much like in many of my movies, there are different themes that are intertwined. I remember, for instance, when I was promoting The Name of the Rose, people would say, but is it a thriller or is it a theological movie? Uh, or is it a love story? Well, it's all together, you know, and this is what I like. I, I'm the sort of cook who likes to blend flavors in order to have a richer meal. And here, I have those different stories. I have a love story, I have a duel, therefore I have a psychological movie and a western in the frame of a war, therefore I have a sort of images of, of war movie. But precisely, the result is what I wanted, is a, is a more complex dish. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I, I know, you know, on each of my movies, people would like to have to catalog things, saying, like on my movie The Bear, they would say, is it a documentary? Or is it, it can't be psychological because it's a bear who is the lead. I say, yes. But people would have to see it to understand what I meant. And, and I always have, should I say, a marketing problem? Always, because I am not, people don't, don't, don't until they see it, then they say, ah, right, yeah, yeah. But how do I explain what is the complexity of this movie to people who have no idea what I d have done? It's difficult. It's, it's better to say, OK, it's a, it's a war movie. It's not. Or should I say it's a love story? Yeah, uh, there is a love story. It's not only a love story. Is it a, a Western? Mm, yeah, in some aspect, but definitely it's different yeah. from, <laughs> from okay. Western. OK. I think I haven't seen that many special effects uh, in one of your films before, with, with the possible exception, uh, exception of Wings of Courage, maybe. Um, is, um, would you say that uh, effects and the way they can be done uh, nowadays can enhance the filmmaker's vision? You know, the, the reason uh, is very simple. Is ten years ago, six years ago, three years ago, uh, visual effects were far behind what they are today. They were too expensive to be affordable. And contemporary filmmaking now has to integrate that new dimension. And I do it with great pleasure, but I'm, I'm very careful not to overuse it, you know. I am using it as, uh, your, the word you use is, is very true, as an enhancement. I, I have only two images in this film that have been entirely created at the computer desk although with elements that are we shot in, in real size. Most of what I have here are other layers. You know, when I build a huge set, for instance, that is a, like a, a square mile of real set, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, the real thing, you can add, after the second layer, which is also true, and the third layer, which is also built, uh, full dimension, then you can shoot other layers in models and then uh, insert those with a computer, the computer technique. But one thing I want to say, a lot of people have a confusion. That has always been made, you know, like integrating uh, a model inside a frame. Oh. But it was not done with a computer, it was done with all the technique and it was not as good, the result was not as good. But it doesn't change much. What does change is it's cheaper and easier. Therefore, this is why I, I can afford to do more. As a director, are you still involved in shots like uh, the, the bombing from above? Every single detail, every uh -huh. the speed of uh, of the bomb that falls. The so you don't give it away to the special effects. You're department. kidding! I am directing. Okay. No, That's no, what no, I but, wanted to hear. No, no, no. But but you know what? What is what is amusing for me now? is once I'm done with my principal photography, I always do my second unit stuff, you know. And then I found myself in London or Dusseldorf or Munich directing a new kind of crew. You know, a lot of people with lots of piercing and, and, and yellow crest of hair and looking at me and so I'm saying, so you're the guy, you, d you deal with uh, you're the airplane, okay. You're the buildings, you, you miss the building, okay. You are smoke, okay, you smoke, and you are the crowd, okay. And who is the principal character? Oh, you are. So now I'm saying, so look, this character goes like this. You see the movement? Like this. 
very much like I'm directing an actor. Mm -hmm. So the guy takes note, takes, takes his digital camera, says, could you do it again for me? Cling, cling. Now I'm saying, you are the building. Okay, the building goes like this. So I'm the building. I'm redirecting my scenes. Uh -huh. uh, but, but you know, it, the nature of it is not much different from what I do with my usual s crew that's going to build the set, with my uh, special effect crew that's going to do the explosion or the wind. I'm doing the same. Um, it's just another way to direct other kind of people who uh, come later in the, in, in the process of making the movie. Those guys could be the new generation of filmmakers, maybe? Sure, of course. Uh, I mean, but you know, uh, filmmakers, uh, some like my uh, uh, colleague Ridley Scott, for instance, was a set designer, and he ends up being one of the best directors in the world. Uh, some others are actors, like Robert Redford, you know, and uh, so people who are creating, who are part of the creation, creating process, can very well make movies. They will probably be tempted to do more of this kind of images because they will feel more comfortable, more at home with those images than people like me who are used to grab reality, you know, to direct real actors. Uh, but you know what? Everything is good as long as it creates a good story and brings uh, evasion dim new, and new dimensions and new ideas. It's wonderful. Okay. I noticed in a couple of your films uh, the characters having sex. Um, that's always a moment of true love, but mm -hmm. yet they have to hide it. Now, mm -hmm. is this a coincidence? You know, everything I, I do reflects my taste. I mean, in film, the way people talk, speak, go to war, return from war. Uh, therefore, when they make love, they do it according to my own uh, modesty or to uh, my own perception of it. Um, hiding, yes, I'm, I'm thinking, mm, not true in a Quest for Fire. Uh, there is a scene where... The fire place? No, 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 there is also, there are two, two scenes where they're not hiding at all. Uh, especially one scene where uh, the young woman shows to the man how to do love in a man's way, That's I right. mean in a, in a human being way. Mm -hmm. And it's in front of the two friends who look at it and don't even understand what is isn't going the second on. Love scene, excuse me, but isn't the second love scene, don't they go away from uh, their... No, uh, no, 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 they're looking. They go... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it seems to me you understand the motive of the hunter in the bear and the sniper now. Uh, very well. Do you have experience? No. Nope. No. But, you know, I, I dig those uh, feelings from what I call the reptile brain, you know, this, uh, this initial brain of the primitive man we all, all have. Mm. And I can understand that very well. The fear of being hunted and the passion of being the hunter, the need, you know, uh, the cruelty that goes with it. I can feel all that inside myself, you know. Um, and I have no problem to know that I am an animal who has those instincts. And when I have those kind of scenes to, to, to do, I dig in those. I never went to a hunting party in my life. Yeah, in Africa. Uh, I've been following guys with arrows and bows and arrows. Um, but, you know, those are so, so much the initial feelings of mankind that I think everyone can relate to that. This is why, you know, in movies, uh, hunting scenes, I mean, a, a man being hunted by another one, everybody identifies. Immediately, we all understand that. Mm -hmm. We all have the fear to be hunted in a corridor or, or in a haunted castle or in, a, in an empty hotel, you know, the fear to open a door and suddenly there's a guy here or there's a shadow and then you run downstairs, the door is closed. Everybody understands that. You don't have to uh -huh. have the experience of it. Well, that's really basic instincts. Yes, it's basic instincts, you're right. Uh, what I found very interesting is the way you show the, the power of the press at that time. Uh, one could really uh, suspect that it's an actual critic of uh, the, the media behaving today. Would you agree? Of course. That, that, was, uh, that was my appeal to do this. I, I, I would not have done this movie if that was not with this angle. For me, what is so extraordinary is to see that 
the, the propaganda of the time badly needed a hero to boost the morale of the troop. Therefore, they created one. Very much like we create a, a product today. Is it a yogurt, or is it a, a, a bra, or is it a pair of shoes? And the fact that they picked a good-looking guy is also very revealing. Because you sell with beauty. Look at the posters all around. It's yeah. always beauty that says everything. A car, a pen. Well, uh, but the, the true life, Vasily didn't exactly look like you. You're kidding. Life. You're kidding. He was an extremely good-looking guy. Ah, he was. When he get old, got older with probably too much vodka, he was not so appealing, I must confess. When, okay. when he returned to Stalingrad when he was 85 and in front of the cameras to explain how he did it in those days, I agree that he's physically quite uh, d d disappointing. But if you look at the early pictures in those days, he's everywhere in the museums, in, in, still today, in Russia. Because for Russian criteria, He's an extremely good-looking guy. He has a very, very beautiful face and nice hair, uh -huh. beautiful blue eyes. So, uh, listen, he would never have become a hero without that good looks. There was another sniper. I think his name was Medvedev. He never got such fame. He was a better sniper. <laughs> but the looks were not as good. Interesting. Uh, I think Monsieur Glor, I told you what would Well, Monsieur like Glor is this. very nasty. <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to say Mr. Glow. Oh, okay. has... <laughs> yeah, you, you have another question? Or? You know, and it costs so much money. It, it multiplies your budget by three. That's third dimension. Mm -hmm. Well, bring, brings you three more, three more times trouble. Uh, and the process of shooting is, I understand, very slow. Well, you know, it's uh, because you, you've got such a huge camera. A camera... Swiss franc, okay. Envelope. Envelope. Swiss francs. And okay. Look. Wow. Reverse. <laughs> oh, the woman, she's naked. And she's not hiding, you see? I don't, why, I don't know why people put their money in it. There is nothing to see. Oh, yeah. Another woman. 